Welcome everybody to our first presentation in the 2021-2022 York Sunbury Historical Society Speaker Series. I'm Melinda Jarrett, the Executive Director of the Freighton Region Museum, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. I'd like to start by asking Ed Casey, the founding director of the Ripples Internment Camp Museum, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Hello, everyone. Um, I was asked to speak about the internment camp museum and how it was formed before I introduced uh, Jordan. Back about 28 years ago, actually, 1993, I was developing alternate programs for students in junior high school. I had 12 and I wanted them to work as a group. So we came up with the idea of the internment camp project. I had read both of uh, Ed Jones's book, Both Sides of the Wire. And we happened to have plans of the actual camp itself. So we got to start in 1993. We spent about six months on the model. We interviewed probably 20, 30 people in the community. And then we also made trips out to the um, site. We dug for artifacts. Someone had told us they were where they thought they might be. So we dug about three feet in the ground. We found pots and pans out of kitchen utensils, brought them back to the school, put them in those uh, trophy cases that you see in schools, continue working on the model. It turned out that the model needed more than those 12 students. And we didn't plan on this, but 50 students volunteered to help. Teachers volunteered, even the bus driver tried to help, and it was a great help. When it was all done, students and I were both pleased with the, the project and the results, and my objectives were met. So we lay back and we thought that was the end of it. But lo and behold, when parents and grandparents and family members came to school to pick up their children, they saw the items in the play cases. They said, hey, my grandfather has an item that came from the camp at home. Would you like to have it? So we said, sure. They kept coming and all of a sudden the news media picked up on it, ran stories on television and radio. All of a sudden we got calls from all over the province asking to, for stories that they had and artifacts and items. We didn't know what to do with everything. So I decided to ask some people in the community that I, that I knew if they would volunteer to be on the committee. They did. And in 1997, in June, we opened our museum in 24 years and we're still operating. And it's located for the person who asked, located in, in, in Minto itself the museum. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. And I met her last week. I was very impressed with her. Her name is Jordan Bailey. She's a third year PhD candidate at University of New Brunswick. Her doctorate research examines the East German secret police and their use of the female body in an intelligent operation. That must be a great uh, read. She completed her master's, Rival of the Fittest upon the relations between German POWs and Canadian citizens living in Ontario at Western, uh, at the uh, Western Ontario. Tonight, Jordan is gonna talk about the internment of Canadians in Canada, concentrating on the Ripples internment camp, the only camp in the Maritime province at the time and the effect it had on the Fredericton community. So without anything more, I want, I'm expecting a great talk and I can't wait for it, Jordan. It's all yours, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ed. So welcome everybody to my talk on the Ripples internment camp. Uh, I'll just begin by saying, uh, kind of, I'll go into detail about my background with POW history. So as an MA student at Western University, I studied the warm reception of German POWs in Ontario communities during the Second World War. When Ontarians saw who was being held behind the barbed wire in their neighborhoods, I argued, they saw them not as fanatic Nazis, but as valuable home front laborers and masculine soldiers, qualities they admired and believed that their own men shared. This shared wartime masculinity and the unspoken whiteness and presumed allowed Germans to build bridges with their captors based on race in Ontario. This project required two years of extensive internment research, 
which included working closely with unpublished government records from Canada's Department of National Defense, the Canadian Directorate of Internment Operations, the RCMP and Privy Council Office at Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa, etc. Additionally, I consulted regional and municipal records in Kingston, Bowmanville, Oshawa, Toronto, Gravenhurst, Chatham, Espanola, Sault Ste. Marie, Nays, Marathon, and Thunder Bay. After I defended my master's, I moved, purely for a different reason, to the one place in the Maritimes that also held German POWs during World War II for my PhD. Now, as part of my foray into New Brunswick internment, I have drawn on the knowledge and work of Ted Jones, Ed Casey, and Andrew Theobald for this talk. So to begin, on November 13, 1941, the community of Bowmanville, Ontario descended into civil war over the decision to gift three raccoons, one adult male and two females, to German POWs housed at Camp 30. Dr. Jerome Davis, Canadian director of the War Prisoners Aid of the YMCA, started the argument when he asked Toronto's Parks Committee if three raccoons could be taken out of Riverdale Zoo and donated to the camp so that, quote, Nazi prisoners might be provided with a form of amusement. The Parks Committee approved of this idea and members voted unanimously, and interestingly, almost without any discussion at all, to allow the three raccoons to be given away. The committee's decision brought expressions of amazement from members of the Board of Control and from the public generally. I feel reasonably sure that our allied prisoners in German camps get only the bare necessities of life, controller Fred Hamilton said. I'm sure their amusement is not one of the concerns of the Nazis. If we must send a donation to the camp, I'd prefer we send them free skunks. A community-wide debate ensued about raccoons or skunks, but in the end, the Germans received the less smelly of the playmates. In New Brunswick, a similar conflict occurred when Prince Edward Island potatoes were chosen to feed the German prisoners housed in Camp 70 or Ripples instead of Camp Car or instead of Carleton County potatoes. When Ottawa declared the former to be better quality than the latter, bad blood developed between the federal capital and New Brunswickers. Now clearly, the polarizing raccoon versus skunk in PEI potatoes versus Carleton County potatoes arguments of 1941 were not Stalingrad. And Canada was no Eastern Front. While 1.1 million German prisoners of war, or POWs, in Soviet captivity perished, weakened by disease, starvation, lack of medical care, and forced labor, the German prisoners of war in Camp 30 made only one complaint to the Red Cross. Because it was formerly a boys' training school, the urinals were way too low. Far from the heat of battle, the site was equipped with a greenhouse, a menagerie, five tennis courts, an indoor swimming pool, a gymnasium, a brewery, a theater, a concert stage, and a zoo, which we now know included three raccoons and an alligator with a mean disposition, among other animals. Camp 30 had a private farm for POWs to grow their own produce, and camp menus contained sausages, eggs, cheese, bacon, mayonnaise, milk, soda, and fruits. The average German POW even gained 12 pounds within the first 10 months of his captivity in Canada. Though seemingly a pleasant life, many German POWs used biblical references to the golden cage to describe their time in Canada. With good food to eat, beer to drink, and cigarettes to smoke, they were trapped in cages of gold, but still cages nonetheless. This analogy characterized the experience of internment also in New Brunswick. So to go into a brief history of internment first, Britain was actually responsible for the internment of Jewish refugees, Italian internees, and German POWs in Canada during World War II. When the war began on September 3rd, 1939, some 70,000 unnaturalized Germans and Austrians were living in Britain. Many were German Jews who had fled Nazi persecution after Hitler became chancellor in 1933. Mounting levels of xenophobia and war hysteria led the British to, quote, intern the lot as enemy aliens. After German POWs were captured during the British Expeditionary Forces retreat from France and in air and naval operations over the English Channel, the North Sea, the Atlantic, or England itself, internment sites began to overflow. After Germany unleashed its blitzkrieg, Britain also became nervous about its national security. If Hitler's forces invaded Britain in Operation Sea Lion, they might free German combatants behind British lines. 
If these men joined the invasion force armed with knowledge that under ordinary circumstances would not be available to Germans, British defenses would definitely be compromised. A clear solution to these security threats was the evacuation of arrested civilian internees, as well as prisoners of war, to Britain's overseas dominion. Canada was known for its size and resources, and it was also beyond the reach of the paratroopers who might try to release the men behind the lines. So it seemed like an ideal place in which to evacuate them to. The last prisoners to arrive in Canada were U-boat crews who surrendered after Germany's defeat in May 1945. Now, here I will take a moment to clarify that the large majority of Jewish refugees were anti-Nazis and genuine refugees from German oppression. On the other hand, while not all German POWs cooperated with the Nazis' genocidal policies, all had been captured while fighting to advance Hitler's agenda. A membership in the German armed forces was not conditional on NSDAP involvement in the early 1930s, but after Hitler purged the SA in the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, the military began to Nazify itself. All German soldiers swore a personal oath of loyalty to Hitler, and the Nazi party and the military were linked in many ways. Furthermore, the complicity of the German regular army in all manner of war crimes has been established beyond any doubt. So every prisoner of war spent some time in at least one of 28 internment camps in Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, or New Brunswick. There was also an internment camp in Newfoundland, although Newfoundland wasn't part of Canada technically until 1949. In an often ad hoc process, the Canadian government searched for locations for camps with the aim of achieving a range of objectives. Keep the cost of the whole operation down, place both prisoners and POWs in already existing facilities created for other purposes, and enable the employment of the POWs and some of the internees in a range of manual occupations. On the same principles, the Canadian government relied especially on veterans of the First World War as guards. They had experience as soldiers, and in some cases had been POWs themselves, and were generally too old to serve on the front lines in this new war with Germany. The Canadian government adhered, as a matter of course, to the Geneva Conventions about the treatment of prisoners, in part because it was concerned about the treatment of its own prisoners overseas. All of these elements colored New Brunswick's experience with captivity. Internment camps were made to house POWs with little in the way of renovations, made from repurposed buildings such as forestry stations, abandoned paper mills, TB sanatoriums, and unemployment relief camps, while others were specifically built to hold over 10,000 POWs each. Each facility brought with it a different degree of comfort. For example, Gravenhurst in Ontario's vacant Calador Sanatorium became a first-class facility for 139 German officers. Just as Ontario's Muskoka region is seen as a place of regeneration today, its German captives also appreciated Camp 20's serene, loca serene location and clean, bracing air. The camp's location on a bluff overlooking Muskoka Bay permitted barbed wire to be strung out into the water so that prisoners could swim and cliff dive during their leisure time. Prisoners were supposed to stay inside the wire, but many rode beyond it while their guards sat and watched them. The camp eventually became designated as a black camp as it housed hardened Nazis. Other camps in Canada were considered gray, which housed German sympathizers and volunteers, or white, which housed conscripted men or forced recruits. But nonetheless, town residents named Camp 20 among the best of wartime Muskoka's tourist resorts. Now, Muskoka was an anomaly. No other camp, including our own in New Brunswick, had as palatial of quarters. So the Ripples internment camp, which you all came here for, also known as Camp B, Camp 70, and the Fredericton internment camp, was the only one of its kind in the maritime provinces. It was located on Route 10, the Rishabukto Road, near a covered bridge over Little River, 15 kilometers west of Minto and 35 kilometers east of Fredericton. The closest village to it was Ripples, earning it its name. Built on the site of the Acadian Forest Experiment Station and Burpee Game Refuge in Sunbury County, Camp Ripples was far away from any population center. This site was chosen for three reasons. First of all, internment camps were classified military secrets. The Canadian public, press included, was not granted access to them without approval. 
Fredericton taxi driver Brucey Green was one of the only civilians regularly allowed through the gates. Second, the natural environment provided security, as you can kind of see on the left. The Crown land was forest and swamp, and Canada's director of internment operations believed that New Brunswick's thick swarms of black flies and mosquitoes in the summer, along with heavy snow in the winter, would deter prisoners from escaping instead of barbed wire, which they also had. The camp's isolation also discouraged any local assistance with only a bush line to communicate with the outside world. One soldier recalled, quote, patrolling this line every day and hunting for breaks that would be caused by moose rubbing up against the tripods upon which the line rested. Third, the encampment seclusion allowed prisoners to work on unlimited projects unaffiliated with the Canadian war effort during their stay. Forestry work parties, for example, offered short-term alternatives to confinement and led many prisoners to assume the romantic lifestyle of a New Brunswick lumberjack. So internment camps were supposed to be military secrets. More than 400 men from different parts of New Brunswick were involved in the initial construction of the camp in the summer of 1940. This included some engineering students from the University of New Brunswick and many, many, many farmers. New Brunswickers from across the province also enlisted as members of the Veterans Guard, uh, with most hailing from rural communities in York and Sunbury counties, such as Durham Bridge, Zeeland, Marysville, and Fernmount. Many of the men had to walk to work, some living as far away as Fredericton or Mukto or Douglas, by hitchhiking, cycling, or getting a ride any way that they could. In dangerous enemy sympathizers, guard Wilfred Wade of Fredericton recall, recalls walking 60 kilometers round trip to the camp when he was stationed there. The mosquito and deer fly infested forests of New Brunswick hardly made this an enjoyable experience. So did being away from home while on rotation. Veterans Guard member Philippe Drapeau from Eel River Crossing would drop paper cups out of the train window as it passed near his home when he was en route to a different camp. The cup had the words East or West written inside it, and his wife and seven kids collected these cups to see where their dad was stationed. So from August 1940 to 1945, the Ripples internment camp experienced two stages. We will focus on stage one first. From August 1940 to June 1941, it housed seven and 11 boys and men, mostly boys, who were predominantly Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria. Even after Britain realized its mistake and advised Canada to release them, Canadian immigration authorities kept Jewish internees detained for up to two years due to homegrown racism and pure anti-Semitism. When the refugees arrived in Ripples, only the skeleton of a camp existed and they had to build the rest of their quarters themselves. Those who enjoyed the physical work continued to take part in labor outings throughout their stay in New Brunswick. From my research, this is something that New Brunswick did well. In 1943, Ontario, for instance, any time a Jewish internee displayed interest in becoming a farm laborer, Frederick Charles Blair, the director of the immigration branch of the Department of Mines and Resources, took it as a scheme to escape internment and enter Canada illegally through the back door of internment. He said, quote, there is no use closing eyes to the impossibility of making farm laborers out of the Jewish enemy alien. It cannot be done. In the words of Blair, a German born prisoner of Jewish race, a Jewish born person, a German born person of Jewish race and faith is far from farming as the poles are apart. Those who did manage to work often experienced anti-Semitic employers in poor working conditions since they did not fall under the protection of the Geneva Convention like German POWs did. Other refugees valued mental labor over physical. Many of the Jewish internees who arrived in Ripples were academics, including an assistant to Albert Einstein and a student of Sigmund Freud's daughter. Another, Fritz Bender, created waterproof plywood and was released from the, hamp, released from the camp to help create the mosquito bomber, which was used in World War II. Many Jewish refugees organized orchestras, camp schools where they taught languages, wrote and distributed newspapers, and also produced art. The University of New Brunswick allowed Jewish internees to borrow books from its Fredericton Library throughout their stay in Ripples, shocking some of the Jewish refugees. One recalled, quote, Fredericton sounded to us like some tiny wild west place. We could hardly believe the news that it even had a university. They, as a result, are the interned group with the largest paper trail. Still, 
Captivity exacerbated rifts between the Jewish refugees. Dietary laws become an issue quite quickly, with 200 Orthodox Jews going on a hunger strike because there was no kosher food. Another 500 non-Orthodox Jews going on a hunger strike because they felt kosher food was absolutely unnecessary. Since there was no branch of the Canadian Jewish Congress in Fredericton, HIP authorities resorted to calling a Jewish owned furniture store on Queen Street. They stated, I would like to get in touch with someone who knows about kosher food. I've got 700 Jews here and they are driving me crazy. Unquote. Eventually the Canadian Jewish Congress did ship the camp kosher food. So as Andrew Theobald writes, incarceration in New Brunswick was unjust and deeply frustrating, but safe for European Jews. This was 1940 and it was also Nazi Europe. Jews were being herded into ghettos and shoved onto trains to unknown destinations. Ripples was not a Nazi concentration camp or later on a death camp on the Eastern Front, but it was not a golden cage either. It was a cage plane for these Jewish refugees. To improve the morale of his companions, one Jewish refugee, Gary Val, sent them a series of letters pretending to be a young girl named Ethel from Montreal who wanted a pen pal. Allegedly 19 years old, five foot five with blonde hair and gray blue eyes, Ethel fooled many Jewish refugees and Val believed that some never caught on to his gig. Some real enemy sympathizers were also sent to Ripples during this stage though. People like Heinrich Holtmann, the Eastern Canada organizer for the Deutsche Bund or German League, which was an organization that tried to rally support for Nazism in Canada, was interned. Likewise, the editor of the Deutsche Bund periodical, which appealed to Northern America Mennonites to try and get them to also back Nazism, was also interned. The second stage of ripples began on January 21st, 1941 with the Daily Gleaner's headline, hundreds of German war prisoners arrive in Canada for internment here. After taking a three week break to build some new guard towers in a water tower in anticipation of quote, the bad guys arriving. Um, these bad guys were German merchant seamen, Italian internees and enemy nationals. German merchant seamen were captured because their vessels played an important role in the strategic planning of the German Reich. And even though they were viewed as reserves of the German Navy, an enemy ship was still seen as an, en an enemy ship by Canadian authorities. The Italians were non-combatants. Uh, 23 of the Italian internees and ripples came from the Maritimes with all but one hailing from Cape Breton. There were none from New Brunswick or PEI. I provided several photos of these internees here. The bottom right is a black and white photograph of them in costume and with instruments at ripples. A drum kit on the far right hand side has the name the hillbillies written on the front. Bottom left is a group portrait of mostly Italians in the garden at Camp Ripples. Barrack buildings can be seen at the left. The group pictures on top are dated 1943. Allegedly, these German and Italian arrivals demanded that the Jewish huts be fumigated and the gardens they had planted be torn up after they arrived. So passing the time became most prisoners' primary occupation. This was made easier thanks to the YMCA and the Red Cross. Prisoners at Ripples relaxed in the garden and established sporting teams, including tennis, football, or soccer, however you want to call it, um, handball, boxing, hockey, gymnastics, and baseball. They lifted weights and they boxed. They enjoyed track and field and calisthenics and made homemade boshi courts. Prisoners founded their own circus and had pets, including Jacob the Crow, who was a fan favorite. The prisoners also created orchestras and smaller bands. While the Italian internees created their band, the Hillbillies, pictured previously, German POWs started their own, called none other than the Hale Billies. In his interview with Ted Jones, the YMCA director, Herman Buschenstein, stated that there were also long deliberations about building a bowling alley at the camp. The unusual and expensive request was actually accepted and was built and paid for by the YMCA. He says this made Fredericton the most popular camp. Resident Betty Gill, whose father was the station agent at Ripples and her uncle was a guard, recalls watching her first ever movie in the Ripples internment camp theater. 
She sat in on one block with her family and other civilians who were permitted entry. Military sat in the second block and internees sat in the last block. Mrs. Pearl Kennedy and Eleanor Cook also remember attending these movies. Craftsmen also used locally available raw or recycled materials to create various art forms, and woodworking was a popular hobby. As Ed Casey discusses in Civilian Interment in Canada, a lot of prisoners created made-to-order furniture for the Fortress of Louisbourg and Point Royal. Some of these items are on display in the internment museum. There's a very impressive collection there. But most woodworking took the form of wooden ships, platters, plaques, cups, game, game dice, and treasure chests. Many also painted, such as P.W. Oscar Bendel, and others drew satirical cartoons, such as the one in the middle. It was not uncommon for prisoners to get really good at making one specific art piece, create multiples of it, and then sell them at art shows held just outside of the gates or to give them to guards. Reginald Middleton, whose father worked in the carpenter shop in the camp, received a small set of bobsleds in a toolbox with his initials on them from prisoners. He also received a piece of metal molded into the shape of a caribou. The prisoners were very intrigued by indigenous culture during their stay in Canada, and this is reflected in their art. So now we'll talk about prisoner of war labor. During World War II, the coastal provinces were actually more in favor of POW labor, while those in the interior and with more POW camps were less likely to approve. This may be the result of there being no internment camps in the coastal provinces, whereas the presence of camps in the interior provinces had incited public fears of escape. To demonstrate how tangled POW and civilian life were in the interior provinces, I pulled up a photo of Donnell and Mudge, a leather tannery which employed POWs and civilian industry in Toronto. Camp 22 was nearby, highlighted on the left but it was surrounded by barbed wire fences and guard towers and the facility's former use as a reformatory helped ease security concerns and fears of escape. Donnell and Mudge had no such security measures, which is kind of in the middle to the right. POWs and civilians worked in close proximity and the tannery was only a block away from civilian residences. More concerning was the tannery's proximity to other industries in New Toronto and the greater Toronto area many of which were fulfilling essential military contacts. Added to this, the Mimico CNR railway yard, a prime target for sabotage and easy method of escape, was only 500 meters from the tannery. New Brunswick's natural environment allowed the separation of spheres. After 1943, prisoners worked on farms, such as Mr. Clayton Reed's farm in Gagetown, and at private labor projects, such as Mrs. Mr. Cunningham's house on 858 Brunswick Street, where four prisoners built an addition to his home that is currently still there. New Brunswickers also worked at Ripples who were not members of the Veterans Guard. For example, Clarence Daniel, a carpenter at the site from the summer of 1940 until Christmas 1941, was hired on for permanent carpentry employment at the camp. Carl Guff, a Fredericton plumber, also stayed on as general maintenance. Sometimes these workers' families would also hang around. Audrey Hunter recalls living in Ripples as a young girl and watching the prisoners unload boxcars at McGill Crossing with her father from a hiding place in the woods. Her friend group would sometimes chat with the prisoners as they worked. She kept a letter from one internee reading, Dear Miss Unknown, until her mother discarded it. So now we'll go into escape. All camp staff and guards were familiar with the recapture plan 70 and its operation. This was because Ripples experienced every manner of escape attempt from 1940 to 1945. Tunneling was a fan favorite, though it was impossible to dig in the New Brunswick winter. For oxygen while tunneling, as Ed Casey told me, prisoners would take cans from the kitchen, cut out both ends, and fix them together with a cloth forming a pipe. At the end, a duffel bag was used as an air pump. It was usually members of the Veterans Guard who caught these schemes in action, although animals also proved quite useful. One cat who lived at the camp gave tunneling prisoners away by digging in the dirt obsessively as it heard rustling coming from down below it. Their cover was immediately blown by the cat. Betty Gill was told as a child about an escape attempt where nine internees took six months to dig a tunnel from their hut to the other end of the camp. They put sand in their back pockets until a guard noticed. 
Dirt was also disposed of in the garden and also in the toilets until they started to plug. Daily Gleaner articles such as, quote, many prisoners may try to escape guards at the internment camps are constantly on alert, gave Fredericktonians a glimpse into this tunneling lifestyle. The first successful escape attempt from New Brunswick occurred January 21st, 1941, when two members of Hitler's Luftwaffe, or air aviators, jumped off their train as it pulled into the Moncton station. Civilians saw two men wearing, quote, scanty material in the dead of winter and phoned the police. When the prisoners were recaptured without issue, one said he thought nothing of the jump from a moving train as he often bailed out of planes. Prisoners also slipped away from forest crews. For example, in August 1942, two German enemy merchant seamen escaped from a work party. As 100 POWs brought firewood to the camp for winter under the supervision of 30 guards, the two escaped during a smoke break. Um, patrol boats were deployed on the St. John River. Civilians were told to watch out for their, their clotheslines and their boats to make sure that the prisoners had not used them as a getaway accessory. And three days later, after a province-wide search, they were found in a swamp, completely obliterated by deer flies and mosquitoes. They had survived in the bush by eating wild berries, and they were completely unprepared for the province's interior, which is why the government put the camp there. Formal release was the only way prisoners exited Camp Ripples, unless they were sent to the York County Gale, which is now Science East, for long-term imprisonment. When this happened, many Fredericktonians feared the dangerous Nazis that were now so close to them. Some even tried to sell their homes to avoid being killed by dangerous Nazis. Others, such as Allison Maston's grandmother, the wife of a guard, cooked meals for the internees and prisoners housed there at the York County Jail. They were given home-cooked cheese, stew, and bread, and Allison could still picture the fresh wheels of cheese at his grandparents' home meant for the prisoners at the time of his last interview with Ted Jones. Mostly, Ripples received prisoners who escaped from their respective internment camps. When 28 German POWs broke out of Angler in 1941, we got two of them. To quote Andrew Theobald, Ripples was the Alcatraz of the Canadian internment system. So now we'll talk about violence, death, and medical care as it occurred at Ripples. During the first phase of the camp, there were absolutely no deaths. During the second, there were 11. The Fredericton Military Hospital on 255 Church Street, which is now an apartment complex, treated internees, though none were formally admitted there. Neighbors would see prisoners smoking on the grounds or tending to the gardens. And serious medical cases were sent to Dr. Oscar Morehouse at Victoria Public Hospital in Fredericton, which had 25 admittances from 41 to 44, including a severed tendon from an ax, a leg amputation, and Wilhelm Bintammer, who lost his front teeth playing hockey at the camp. Prisoners were also sent to Fredericton Hospital when they were assaulted by fellow men. One man was sent there with a concussion and multiple lacerations after being assaulted by a hardened Nazi prisoner. Prisoners were also admitted to the provincial hospital in St. John for mental observation, paranoia, and also dementia. There, unlike Ontario, there were no kangaroo courts, public hangings, or suicides at Ripples, but six German seamen, one Italian seaman, and three Canadian civilians died at the camp. Maximilian Weber failed to regain consciousness after surgery to remove an abscess from his brain. Joseph Watzinger died in 1942 of acute pericarditis. Carl, Carl Scheuermann of, of brain hemorrhage the same year and Eric Lenzian of pneumonia. Max Bosca died of bowel cancer. Night nurse Grace Bruce and Fredericton remembers the deaths of Weber and Bosca having written their lovely wives letters dealing with their time in New Brunswick. Nick Adams' funeral home in Fredericton was in charge of their burial arrangements and Father Nagel performed their last rites. Their burials took place in the Fredericton Cemetery and wreaths were purchased from Ada Schleyer's greenhouses located on Charlotte Street. The German prisoners now lie in the Wargrave Cemetery in Kitchener, Ontario, previously named Berlin. Replicas of their grave markers as pictured are held at the internment camp museum in Minto. A member of the Veterans Guard also died while escorting prisoners to Ripples by train in 1942. 
So, on May 9th, 1945, the camp commandant read Germany's surrender aloud to the last 150 internees on the camp parade square. Copies of the surrender were thrown throughout the camp huts and the greeting, hail amongst the prisoners was banned. In Minto, quote, the population and a number of guards from Camp B marked VE Day by burning an effigy of Hitler in a large bonfire to the accompaniment of great cheers from the assembled crowd. Several months later, on September 4th, 1945, as the rest of New Brunswick got ready for a new school year, Ripples became, in the words of Ted Jones, an instant miniature ghost town. Only two internees from Ripples remained in Fredericton after the war ended, both German nationalists. Having become friends from behind the wire, they moved into an apartment together on 527 King Street before going their separate ways. After all the internees left, the camp's 52 buildings sat empty for a year. Ottawa sold these buildings as crown assets in 1947 for only $101 and up. UNB purchased some of the buildings, fixtures and plumbing and moved them to its Fredericton campus. People also used the buildings as cottages or homes around the Minto and Grand Lake area. Darlene Tapley's family cabin, for example, was formerly the internment camp barbershop. Many of these buildings made entirely of wood have since burned. So this building, originally configured as a medical facility um, to, in 1940 to treat patients at Ripples, um, by the spring of 1947, it was transported to the location of the old Gibson Roundhouse. There, it was used as a storage facility by Roundhouse owner Ashley Coulter, um, and nowadays this is our beloved Pick Roots. So in 2015, it was moved to Majorville. So the campground sat purposeless until 1997, when teacher Ed Casey and a team of students from Minto Elementary Junior High began a project to learn about the camp and unearth artifacts. After donations snowballed, the New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum was created in the Minto Town Hall building, with the Ripples Historic Walking Trail following in 2006. Today, on the site of the former camp, one can see the skeletal remains of the camp's water tower and a bright blue map. Peppered with informational signs about the camp's past, this one kilometer trail makes it easy to picture what the camp was like in its heyday. The locations of the original one-story barrack, mess hall, recreation hut, tennis court, and barbed wire are all demarcated by interpretive signs. Someone has even carved 10 human faces into trees on the trail near important camp locations. So, having visited most internment campsites in Canada, I can say that New Brunswick is doing significantly better than most provinces when it comes to preserving its internment history. Though the buildings of Ripples are gone, uh, the site is better conserved than still standing sites such as Camp 30 in Bowmanville, which is in poor condition, vandalized, abandoned, and neglected despite its historic site status. Though the buildings of the former boys' training school have not yet crumbled, they've come close to demolition before, since Camp 30 lies in disrepair, with no cleanup efforts initiated. And it's the playground for arsonists, graffitiists, and most of all, official inaction. Among many fires set by teens there, the POW admin building and its solid oak staircases, where Hans von Ravenstein, second only to Erwin Rommel in the Africa Corps, smoked cigars, drank beer, and planned his escapes, was torched by arsonists in 2009. Local historians such as Lynn Philip Hodgson argue it looks more like the set of The Walking Dead than a national historic site. Ripples, with its isolated location, stoic human faces carved into trees and plentiful interpretive signs, is already respected by New Brunswickers, which is half of the battle in preserving internment history. People are less likely to vandalize a former camp when they know the local history. But regardless of whether Ripples becomes a historic site or not, I will say that the second half of the camp, the military side, has not been excavated yet, and it should be. Lots of history is still buried there, from guards to from locals, um, so I think that should also be a priority. I'll also leave you with the consideration that the social history of Ripples internment camp is a venue for future research. I want to know more about how internment impacted the lives of ordinary people living in Fredericton, Minto, or Ripples, etc. What were their struggles during the war and how did internment change their community? Unlike my research into the responses of Ontario communities to the enemies in their midst, for example, I do not know if Fredericktonian women were equally as infatuated with POWs or if intimate relationships ever occurred. 
I'm curious to see what is out there and this would be an interesting topic to dig further into. So with this talk, I wanna get away from the idea that local means irrelevant or that local history is less interesting than national. Knowing one more piece of our province's history, we can feel more connected. And I'll send it back to Melinda. Thank you very much, Jordan. That was fascinating. And um, wow, what a, what a great uh, social history and a very detailed explanation of the uh, experience of Jewish um, uh, Germans and also of the Nazis who were here. John Boileau uh, asked, who decided? where the camps were built. And given the distribution of the camps, was any pork barreling involved on the part of politicians? Um, essentially like the directors of the internment operations and the Department of National Defense determined where they were going to, to place the camps. However, they did receive um, a ton of offers from civilians, which was I have something that was very interesting that I found in my Ontario research, and I'm sure it was the same in New Brunswick, um, a lot of civilians actually offered up their, their locations and if they had a camp or if they had a certain amount of property on their, um, in their possession, um, the Department of National Defense received countless letters from civilians offering their property for the use of an internment camp. Um, but yeah, so it was the Department of National Defense that decided where the camps were going to be. Um, there was kind of a hierarchy, obviously, of people that made the decisions. Um, but no, I think politicians were pretty much on board. There was a couple um, skirmishes when, I guess, so using Espanola, Ontario, for example, um, it was a paper mill and they kind of had to give the re surrounding residents, they had like 24 hours to get out of their house. Um, so they could either like, they had to leave, they had no choice. So politicians disagreed with that strategy of um, you have 24 hours to get out of your house and then we're using your, pro like your property as an internment camp. Um, but the locations were pretty, they had a specific set of stuff that they needed with the internment camps and if they met it, they met it. Okay, um, now Todd Casey has a question. Uh, he says, great presentation, Jordan. Can you please expand on the issues of uh, labor at Camp 70? Did they get paid? What could they spend their money on? Yep, so they did get paid but they didn't receive Canadian dollars. So what they did is they got coupons and or like a ticket and they could use this ticket at the camp store, but they couldn't, it wasn't money that they could use in society. Um, so they had the camp store, they could get anything that they needed there. It was through the YMCA, um, so they could do that. And their wage was cemented by the Geneva Convention. So they would receive, I think it was like 50 cents an hour or something like that, um, or a, maybe a day, I think it was a day. Um, so they had a very set wage, but the Jewish prisoners, when they managed to work, um, in spite of all the anti-Semitism, they weren't protected by the Geneva Convention, so they had way less wages. Um, so they, they, they didn't have to be up to par with other standards, so they were very underpaid, um, and they had worse experiences within their employment environment. They were often openly anti-Semitic, um, and they were very poor work conditions. So you see a large difference between the standards that the Germans were used to in internment and then the standards that the Jewish refugees were used to. Um, William McKinnon would like to ask, did you see much evidence of non-maritimers being sent to Ripples? I'm a New Brunswicker in Hamilton and our most famous mobster, Rocco Perry, was interned in Ripples. Interesting. I mean, I would say the German prisoners of war would be non-maritimers that were interned in Ripples. Um, most of the internees were from the Maritimes. Um, a lot of them went on. So I'll, I'll, I'll use the example of people that were from, how do I word this? Yeah, so most of them were from the Maritimes. A lot of the Italians were from Cape Breton, for instance. I'm not sure about the mobster. I haven't heard about him. But a lot of the people, even if they weren't from the Maritimes, a lot of them ended up staying in the general vicinity. So we have a couple Germans came back, a couple Jewish refugees. A lot of them had a massive impact on Canadian culture after the war. Um, and we have, for example, some of our Jewish refugees became Supreme Court judges in Quebec. 
So a lot of people didn't end up straying too far after the war. They would go, uh, the Germans were repatriated and then they came back and some Jewish refugees were allowed to just stay. So a lot of people remained close to home here. Well, that, that leads to the next question by Mitchell, who says, after the prisoners left, where did most of them go? Yeah. So the Germans uh, could not stay because um, of the Geneva Convention. They had to go back to, they, a lot of, um, if they were working on a farm, a lot of times their employers would kind of petition to keep them around, um, but they couldn't do that. So they all went back to Germany. Um, usually by 1947, they were all back. Um, and then some just picked up and moved right back. Um, and then the Jewish refugees, if, as long as they had, there's a couple ways they could stay, but if they had a sponsor for one thing, somebody that would pay for them to stay and kind of get settled, then they could stay. So it was easier for them. Um, and the Italian internees were all Canadian anyway, so they all stayed here. That leads to the next question. Patrick asks, where in Cape Breton did these Italian prisoners come from? Just a second, let me ask that again. Hang on a second. He I, uh, there's so many questions coming. Where in Cape Breton? Why those Italians specifically? I'm not sure. I don't know where in Cape Breton. Haven't been there myself yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where in Cape Breton. I just know that that's generally where they came from. I would imagine it's Sydney in the mines. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, I don't know for sure, but I'm just, I, I do know of Italians that's working in, this, in the mines. Um, Charles uh, asks, what happened to the Jewish refugees after 1941? Well, a lot of them were interned still, even though um, they were innocent and Canada knew that they were innocent, they weren't released. So a lot of them were, they were, um, here stuck in internment camps and a lot of them ended up going back to Britain um, because it would be dangerous to go home. So I'm, I don't know the full story. I'm sure some of them had sad endings, but I would like to think that most went back to Britain. To get, I think they were, they were still interned in Britain, but that's where they went. Okay. Um... Todd just wanted to add that out of province prisoners included uh, the famous mayor Camille Hood mm -hmm. of Montreal. Everyone knows that story, or most people do. Uh, now, there's another question. Uh, Richard Yeoman, uh, is there any evidence that you have found which shows how St. John's Jewish community responded to the Ripples camp before its second phase? Uh, volunteers, uh, societies, excuse me, volunteer societies such as the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society. For example, um, what which was founded in St. John. So, any evidence there? Not that I've seen. Although I'm sure if you went into those societies' archives, they would probably have stuff. If they worked with the Jewish refugees in uh, in Ripples, then they would have the documents for that. Okay, and that would be uh, Catherine uh, Biggs Craft, who is the uh, executive director of the St. John Jewish Historical Society Museum. And I bet you she does have an answer to that question. Uh, Jonathan Vance, Jonathan Vance, hmm. he says the Italians uh, came, mostly came from the industries, in, industrial uh, Sydney and North Sydney, as I, I suspected. Yeah. Now, uh, John Boileau asks, what can you tell us about Camille Hood? Uh, Mayor of Montreal during his time at Ripples. I didn't look into him in detail. Um, he sprinkled throughout the books, certainly, but he wasn't the focus of this presentation. But if you're interested, there's definitely a lot. In, I can refer you to Andrew Theobald. Ted Jones has a lot on him in both versions, or I guess the, the, the second volume of his Both Sides of the Wire book. There's a lot about him in there. John Ga Gahagan says, I've heard that at least one of the Jewish interns ended up working on the Manhattan Project in the US. Comment? I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of them were extraordinary minds that were interned here. Which is why, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them valued mental over physical labor. And we see that in what they went on to do after the war. Um, and they have a huge paper trail just because they were so active in academics and engineering and, and everything. Okay, uh, so it look, oh, one more question. Lisa Todd asks, um, the second that is, uh, these are just come rolling in. Um, okay, Lisa, how were Japanese 
prisoners treated in comparison to the German prisoners, specifically in the Ontario camps. So what might this tell us about the nature of Canadian racism during the Second World War? That's a good question. Yeah, so I did a lot of my master's on Japanese Canadians um, in relation to Jewish refugees and German prisoners of war and kind of what the hierarchy was of race. Um, comparison to Germans, when it came to the Germans in World War II, Canadians kind of had this idea of they were good Germans and there were bad Germans. So they were the good and then they were the bad. They weren't all Nazis, those were just the bad Germans. But when it came to Japanese, they was, there was the Jap. There were, they, they weren't afforded the same degree of pluralism as the Germans were. Um, and in terms of masculinity, we see all these German women in Ontario kind of gawking over these bronzed fit men that have come from being sunned in the Africa campaign and um, newspapers kind of gawked at like their thighs and they were so, they're military men. And we see the opposite. We see uh, Japanese Canadians being described as short, um, yellow. A lot of the time they were described as rats. Um, they were not, even though they were Canadian, they were less accepted than people who were Canada's enemy in wartime were. And we also had Germans were afforded parole, which I don't think I talked about. Um, so you could give your word of honor and you could go and explore um, the city that you were in. Um, Japanese were afforded no movement at all. And then the fact that they were evacuated made them stigmatized as dangerous. So there was very different perceptions of a group that was Canadian and one that was the enemy. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, now, uh, Nancy wrote that, just a second, make sure. Yes, it's Nancy. My mother passed away eight years ago when she was 100 years old. Mm -hmm. She remembered the camp very well. She was very impressed with the fact that a professional musician from the camp was taken into Fredericton on a regular basis to practice playing on a piano or an organ uh, for, at one of the churches. Mm -hmm. How about that? We really see music as kind of a, a bonding tool when it comes to the internment camp. Um, we see, oh, I forget what, it's the something swingers. That's what their name was. And they were a group of women and they were, they would sing, they were a singing group and they would go into the internment camp, I think once a week and they would perform for the officers in the mess hall. Um, and we would, and then oh, the, the prisoners would also be there. And yeah, prisoners were allowed to leave the camp to perform music. Um, if they were discovered to be very good at something like Fritz Bender, who created the mosquito bomber because he figured out how to make waterproof plywood, um, they were allowed out of the camp if the authorities figured out that they had a talent that they could utilize. William McKinnon, getting back to our Rocco Perry mobster guy. Thank you. He said Perry strayed back to Hamilton to meet his doom in 1945 tied to cement at the bottom of Hamilton Harbor. <laughs> if anyone's wondering where, what happened to him, uh, he perhaps he should have stayed in Ripples, he says. <laughs> now, here's another one, Gail. My, okay, Gail, actually, Gail, we, we communicated with Gail today and we we're very glad to have you, Gail, and your brother. My father, this is quite a story. My father was in Ripples Camp B and remained in Canada went to McMaster to study social work, studied in Mac McBill and UBC, McGill and UBC, worked as an x-ray technician for the Canadian Army and did return to England for a few years. There are many unanswered questions about his life in terms of timeline. Unfortunately, my father revealed very few details about his experience at Ripples and Farnham, yet he seemed traumatized by the experience and he was a Jewish ref, uh, prisoner. So yes, he probably was by the sounds of it. And I can speak to that too. A lot of the time um, in these internment camps, the, I have talked about before that the Germans were preferred. They were, they were Aryan, they were white, they met Canadian whiteness standards. But what would happen in these internment camps is the veterans guard because the Germans understood military protocol. So they understood how to be a soldier. They understood commands. Um, the veterans guard often preferred them. Whereas the Jewish refugees were not equipped to respond to military language. 
the guards often thought that they were lazy, that they just weren't listening, that they were stupid because they weren't these military, they weren't, they were just innocent civilians. Um, so we have a lot of anti-Semitic, I'm not sure if it was the case in Fredericton, but speaking of Canada generally, that was generally the case with internment camps. Um, so perhaps that happened to Gail's father. We'll have to do some digging. Oh, okay, well, Gail, I hope that you will be in touch with Ed and Jordan. I've given them your contact information and I'm, I know Ed was interested uh, in speaking with you. He said he's gonna help out. Uh, now, uh, now we can open up the floor to um, uh, anybody who would like to ask a question using their, uh, their camera, okay? So if you do do that, you need to unmute yourself, okay? So, and uh, we'll do one at a time. So if there's anybody who would like to ask a question using your camera, let's do that now. And I'm sure there must be a few people who have some questions to ask. I know it's been extremely interesting and there's so many personal stories here in Fredericton. Um, I'm sure that there are a few people who are here tonight who probably um, had a relative who worked at the camp. Uh, I know one of the young women who works with me, her grandfather worked at the camp. And uh, uh, so it is very rele relevant here locally, although mm -hmm. we don't think about it because it seems so far in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very yeah. relevant. And that would be interesting for someone to compile all of those personal anecdotes into a book as a, just a general, without the military aspect, just social history. Okay, I see Shelly has unmuted and she's willing to ask a question. So here we go, it's Shelly. Uh, I wanted to say is that uh, Jordan as well, that this was very interesting presentation. Um, I'm a member of the Frank and Jewish community so, and you really done a lot of homework here. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Ted Jones was my English teacher um, here in Fredericton as well. And I did go to the, um, the Ripples Museum um, at the school, but it's been a while. I'd like to return, but you have a lot of information. The only thing that I remember and hearing is uh, that they, the Jewish um, refugees went on strike. They wanted kosher food. So the Fredericton rabbi here in the community at that time made it possible that they could have kosher food. Um, every year in Fredericton, we have a Holocaust memorial, but with the pandemic, it's, um, it's been different. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of information there as well. But um, um, what we're compiling now at the Sigulizo Synagogue, and I know it's off topic, but sort of similar, we're doing the history of the Jews here and doing a museum in the synagogue. So um, that's ongoing right now. Um, but I, I, I really look forward to hearing more of, um, of everything, the research. It's uh, a very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. The history of the Jews in Fredericton, yeah. Okay, I think Gail wants to ask a question. And thank you, Shelley. Uh, that sounds amazing. You, and we, so Gail, your turn. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much detail you want me to get into, but um, basically I didn't find out that we had Jewish ancestry until I was nine, quite by accident. Um, we were uh, went to a Lutheran church in St. Catharines and uh, um, I was at school, I think I was fifth grade and we were doing a geography section and the teacher was asking us where our parents were born. And I said, my dad was born in Germany. My mom was born in England. And a couple of the Jewish kids kind of turned around and looked at me and they said, how old is your dad? And at that time he would have been about 47. And they said, your dad's a Nazi. And I thought, uh, I didn't know what to say. I just had no, I, I, I did not think my father was a Nazi, but I, so I went home and asked my mother and she explained, yes, dear, I have to tell you something about your, your history. And uh, yeah, I don't think I ever talked to those Jewish kids about that. I think I just, I was so um, overwhelmed that my dad didn't talk about it until much later. So it, he, he was obviously very traumatized. He was an only child, very close to his mother. Um, took him many years to find her after, I think two years to find her after the war. Um, and uh, 
anyway, but I guess the one question, <laughs> one thing, my father was would eat anything and everything. He was a huge eater, but he would avoid, he would eat roast potatoes, fried potatoes, any big, big potatoes, but he would leave a pile of mashed potatoes. He would eat everything else on his plate. And I wondered if they were served. My only explanation was that they must have eaten a lot of mashed potatoes at either Ripples or Farnham, I don't know. Yes? Yeah, that okay. Sense. I, I know that there was, a, the, like I spoke about before, like the huge debate between whether they were gonna serve PEI potatoes or Carlson County potatoes. So I would imagine that it would have been a staple food group. Yeah, that was the only food my dad would not eat. I swear he did eat, except for wasabi. He, he ate that by accident one time at a Japanese restaurant. And that was not good. But yeah, he would eat anything. So it, it was just a matter of principle for him, but he didn't explain why. So thank you for explaining. Yeah, I would imagine that would be a staple figure. It's just easy to prepare. You could just throw it in for a, a mass amount of people. Yeah, I'm sure that they probably ate that a lot. Now, Gail, when we, we spoke earlier today, uh, you mentioned that it was, it was your, your grandfather. Grandfather died in Auschwitz, correct? Mm -hmm. Your great grandfather. Um, no, it was, it was our grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, they, my grandparents went to Theresienstadt together. Um, but I, and after my father, my father died in 2016 at age 95. So that's a pretty decent life. He was very healthy until he was probably 93. Um, I don't know if my brother is here, but hopefully he is, because um, um, I'm, I'm the mouthy one, as I said. <laughs> but he, um, uh, I found my grandfather's ID card from the Theresienstadt ghetto, stamped 1944. Um, it must have been some, I don't know how my grandmother was able to keep this, but but so at some point, again, I, we don't know the history. It's been, let's just say, um, I find it a little bit um, difficult doing this by myself sometimes. So I, I've been going in baby steps, trying to like just going, my father left all this, these documents that we went through. And um, so, yeah, and we found out only recently that he died at Auschwitz. We didn't know really because there were records saying that he died in Berlin. And I thought, what? That doesn't make sense. He was at, so yeah, it was, it's been very confusing process. And because I'm not part of the Jewish community, I kind of felt, um, I'm not sure how I'll be welcomed, like, you know, in terms of exploring that. So I'm sure I would be, but it's still, it's, you feel a bit of a disconnect, I guess. Well, I'm sure that uh, in your certainly here in the local Jewish community, uh, if they're they're putting together a museum, uh, they will be discussing those experiences of the Jews who came here to the Ripples camp. And I know Ed might be able to help you, and maybe Jordan too. So we've connected you uh, via email. Hopefully, you'll be able to uh, carry on and get some get a little bit more information. Thank you, Gail, for sharing that. That's uh, quite a story. Quite a quite a story. And uh, I hope that you're able to uh, get the information that you are seeking. You're, you've got quite a task ahead of you. Uh, okay, if there, are there any other questions uh, that someone would like to ask? Because um, I don't, there's no more in the chat and we are about, just about uh, reaching the time where we would normally uh, call it an evening. So if anyone else has any questions, um, Shelly said, by the way, Shelly said Pure 21 in, uh, in Halifax is a good source. Yes, that might be very helpful for you. Um, so uh, if there's no more questions, I think that we will, um, unless uh, Jordan would like to as, add something. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Jordan? Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to add something. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Jordan. I've learned, I thought I knew a lot, but uh, I learned a lot tonight. And it was wonderful. Uh, the information you shared with, with us, and uh, I'll pass that along to the museum staff as well. Thanks again, really appreciate it. Also, uh, at the Frederick Region Museum, we have one of those uh, wonderful, uh, beautiful, beautifully carved uh, grave markers. Uh, so that's uh, in our collection. 
Yeah, I would, I would highly recommend going to the New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum. That's what I'll end with. It's extraordinary. Ed Casey's done such a good job. Um, you walk in and there's a tour and you see all a ton of artifacts made from the prisoners and just their artistic ability and what they were able to do from Jewish refugees to German prisoners to Italians, just like the ability to hone skills while they were interned. Um, it's incredible to see in such, such detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming tonight uh, to our first presentation in the 2021-2022 series. Uh, it's been great, very interesting. Thank you, Jordan Bailey, for your amazingly interesting presentation. Ed Casey as well. Uh, you know that if you have any questions, you can always contact us at the Fredericton Region Museum at fredertonregionmuseum at gmail.com. You can check out our website at www.fredertonregionmuseum.com or call us at 455-6041. And uh, we have a great Facebook presence, so there's all kinds of contacting going on there. Uh, I'd like to remind you that on uh, Thursday, November 4th, our next speaker will be Diane Kelly, who's going to uh, talk about her brand new book, Asleep in the Deep, Nursing Sister, Anna Stamers, and the First World War. So until then, thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and uh, hope to see you on November 4th. This virtual speaker series was organized by Charles Ferris, who is the chair of the programs committee. He's also a member of the board of directors of the York Sunbury Historical Society. Uh, Charles also has the help uh, we do of our, our extraordinary IT consultant, Stephen Thomas, and the help of Peter Malmberg, who helps us with the um, uh, publicity and promotions. I'd also uh, be remiss if I didn't mention Alexandria Block, who edits our um, Zoom presentations down into something that can be viewed on YouTube.